Hello, everybody. Welcome back to episode 17 of the Progressive Democrats of Howard County podcast. I'm the president of the Progressive Democrats of Howard County and the uh, co-host of our podcast. My name is Jake Burdett. I'm joined by my other co-host, uh, Harry Hogg. How are you doing, Harry? Hey, Jake. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so, Jake, we, uh, we were doing these podcasts uh, back-to-back for like a couple of weeks, and then all of a sudden, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we stopped. So, uh, we're, we're back uh, today with uh, more of the Slate interviews. Uh, so, uh, this is very good. Happy. Absolutely. You know, uh, we're, we're, we're very busy people here. We got our fingers in a lot of different pies. So, and, you know, the whole purpose of these interviews is we are interviewing uh, candidates from the HOCO for a slate running for Democratic Central Committee. And both myself and here are also candidates. So that's why we're not able to uh, pump these out as often as we would like, because we have to uh, campaign for ourselves and other candidates as well. But um, very delighted to be joined by uh, two other uh, Slate members, um, Diedrich Asante Muhammad and both Ahmad Khan. We will be talking to uh, Diedrich in part one. Um, so, uh, Diedrich, uh, full name Diedrich Asante Muhammad, uh, would you like to, uh, you know, introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about, you know, why you decided to run for Sunday? Sure. Again, uh, my name's Diedrich and Diedrich Asante Mohammed, though I grew up in Colombia and I grew up as Diedrich Dunbar. Uh, my father's Harry Dunbar. My mother is uh, Sheila McCurdy. Um, I came here when I was one years old. My parents came here from New York City. They were here, uh, you know, they came as part of the, I think, you know, kind of early uh, transplants to Colombia who bought into the idea of creating, you know, the, I think they used to call it like, like the, the new town. And the idea was to kind of create a multiracial, meaning at that time, primarily black and white, uh, multi-class community. Um, and my uh, father being African-American, growing up in segregated Arkansas, my mother uh, being white, uh, growing up in segregated Alabama, were looking for a place where they felt they could uh, raise their kids in a positive space and uh, came to Columbia, Maryland. I grew up here, uh, went to college in Massachusetts and uh, moved back here about 12 years and have been raising my family and uh, working here, working out of DC, but living uh, in town center, uh, Columbia. And I've always been very active politically. My parents were active politically when they were here. Uh, I've done most of my political work more so did some in New York City. I used to work for Reverend Al Sharpton. I uh, was worked at the National NAACP where I was chair of the economic department. Most of my professional career has been focused on uh, racial economic inequality, uh, but I've always wanted to get more engaged locally. And this is my kind of entrance into getting more involved in local politics as well. So uh, uh, Diedrich, um... Uh, just based on, you know, uh, having, you know, read your um, bio and, uh, you know, uh, listening to, to you uh, now, you know, you definitely have uh, uh, what I would call, you know, a lot of the substantive experience in terms of, you know, to, to, to meaningfully contribute to, uh, um, to uh, you know, the, the, the county in, in, uh, as part of the central committee. Um, what um, one of the claims in terms of you know that's been made and you know in Howard County that that's that's repeated often is you know the um, the, the hallmark is you know the um, it's it's an inclusive community and you know there the uh, that there are there is um, um, you know that's one of the claims that you know the, the, it's an inclusive community. Um, um, based on what you know, what you what you have seen, uh, you know, do you think? Um, how do you think this multi-class vision that was started, multi-class, multi-racial vision that uh, that was started, as uh, um, how how do you think that has sort of evolved, and you know, and what, where is it right now, based on what your observation? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's been you know weakened. You know, I think. You know, to, on the positive side for Columbia, I think it 
uh, it was structured pretty well in that, you know, there was intentional design of making sure in the early parts, and again, talking more about Columbia than Howard County as a whole, right? But, uh, you know, large parts of the land were bought up and they were bought up. So you'd have single family homes, uh, town homes, as well as apartments all in the same areas, right? And that people would, you know, interact through neighborhood centers and send their kids to similar schools. And so I think that, you know, was positive. And, it, you know, it shows, again, you have to structurally create a space for uh, people to be able, you know, to be together. And that, uh, that demands a lot of economic consideration. I think what has happened is that Columbia was very successful in becoming a very nice place to live, a lot of planned, um, you know, uh, I love the path system, you know, a lot of uh, planned green space, these types of things. Um, but I think uh, what has occurred over time is uh, developers have been able to kind of, you know, push over that system, right? Because developers aren't focused on making sure that there's single family rentals and townhomes so different people of different income can all live together. Developers are trying to make as much money as possible, which usually means pushing forth wherever they can as many McMansions that they can sell at the highest price, right? And I think, you know, uh, that, that has weakened. I think also people came here in the late 60s, early 70s, because they wanted to be part of an inclusive community. I think uh, inclusive racially and economically. I think over time, as Columbia became known as being such a nice suburb, many people came here just to be part of another elite suburb, right? And so there's also that type of change in, uh, in, in, in what people came here for. Um, and, you know, and it's challenging to try to create, and that was the challenge of Columbia, trying to create something that wasn't present in larger society. And larger society will have, uh, uh, you know, its impact on uh, these designs. And, you know, this is why I want to get involved is, can we do some interesting things to uh, try to strengthen the uh, mixed income, diverse community that uh, I think has been an example People read about Columbia all across the country as a successful plan development. Can we, uh, you know, show that not only with the original design, but that we can actually push to go back to that uh, more original intention of being multi-class, multi-racial? Yeah, and, you know, sort of touching on that related to, you know, the community that you and I have grown up in and that we all are, are running in. Um, as well, I like as, that you, you know, say we, you and I like because it makes me sound like I'm like young like you. So I, I like <laughs> that you that keep us together. So yeah, go ahead. yeah, we, we grew up <laughs> at different times in this county, but we still you know grew up in the yeah. county nonetheless. Right. But uh, but you know, sort of uh, you know the work that you do every day and have been doing for a long time. You know, uh, centering around uh, economic inequality, specifically racial economic inequality. And I know me personally, one of like the more radicalizing moments that kind of woke me up was the 2016 uh, Bernie Sanders campaign. I was 18 years old at the time. And, you know, he didn't touch as much on racial economic inequality. His message was more general economic inequality. But I think the reason his message resonated with me so much is because I could see the truth of the wealth inequality and economic inequality in our own county, in what was the third wealthiest county in the country. So I'm curious, Diedrich, what is growing? You know, first I would ask, you know, what are some of the racial inequities that you see in Howard County and, and what could be done? And did you notice those growing up? And is that what steered you towards that work? Or did you start working in that field? And then you noticed, wow, a lot of this stuff applies locally here at home. Yeah, I mean, I think what you know, inspired me again, like my mother was a white woman from segregated Alabama. My father was a black man from segregated uh, Arkansas. And then eventually uh, he moved to Los Angeles. But so, you know, I wasn't allowed to go to my family reunions on my white side till I was like 22. So I was always, and I think there were some critiques of people of my generation and probably after is that Columbia was a bubble and, you know, they didn't know how bad things were. Like, that was always clear, things were bad. <laughs> and I also understood that there was, it was less bad in Colombia, but there was still always racism in Colombia, right? There was still always 
you know, some aspects of racial inequality and prejudice and, you know, had to deal with those issues, but it was, you know, better than many places. And I think, you know, a little bit about our generational difference. I think, you know, in my mind, the most progressive presidential campaign in my lifetime was Jesse Jackson of 88. And I was about 15 years old then. And that really was this I, uh, pushing forth, you know, what he called a rainbow coalition based off of, you know, previous rainbow coalitions with a very progressive economic uh, platform that was really trying to focus on uh, bridging inequality, racial and economic, you know, through this person who was reaching out to Native Americans, reaching out to Latinos, reaching out to poor white farmers, you know, talking about uh, homosexual uh, equality in 88. <laughs> Right, like not, you know, like Obama wasn't for gay marriage when he ran in 2008. And Jesse Jackson, a minister from South Carolina, was talking about these issues in 88, talk and related them internationally to Palestine. And so he had a real clear politic of how progressivism, you know, started from, you know, uh, where, where you live locally to national and international. And that, you know, and that was a real inspiration for me. It was inspiration even for, when my parents did politics, my father was always much more involved in local politics and was always very critical of development developers. My mother was involved in local movements around international policy. And so we were, she was very involved in Howard County. She helped set up Howard County Friends of Central America. She was part of the women's group, which was really a big thing in the 70s, talking about, you know, feminist critiques and, and what have you of society. So seeing how they were, and I think that was inspiration to me of how to raise a family and to try to live your daily life uh, to reflect a politic that also had a national and international uh, connection uh, was all uh, inspiring to me. And then one other thing too is, you know, at, at some parts of my life, uh, my household was pretty poor. And I think that was really important to me because it was able to see um, how, you know, um, you can live in a nice suburb and a lot of people live pretty well, but to not, you know, but to have subsidized lunches, right? To only be able to do an after school activity if they gave you a scholarship, you know, helped keep the reality that, because you know, I think that is one thing that has changed over time is when Columbia first started, it wasn't, you know, the, one of the richest, or Coward County wasn't one of the richest counties in the country. And it's really uh, become that, uh, and people don't even talk about it. People often don't always talk about wealthiest county in the country, with the highest income state. You know, the people are like, well, I don't feel rich. I don't feel high income. Uh, and, you know, you won't if you hang around other people with more money than you, right? That's one thing I learned. Like, you always feel, um, you know, that, that you don't have a lot if you hang around with people who have more. But if you can stay connected to really a broad base of society, you can really be much more thankful for the uh, things you have. And I think in Columbia, there's actually a lot of opportunity. That's one thing I loved about Columbia is like growing up, we didn't have much money, is I really used the path system. Like I had a free park that I can go out and play in, right? And that was, you know, a, a great thing. I had a school system that was, you know, safe. And it's, it's some of the racial inequality I saw was I went to Oakland Mills High School. And I remember at that time, people were starting, starting to ghettoize parts of Columbia, right? And there were old Columbia, you know, and where there were more black students, right? And that was like, Oakland Mills was a, was a hood school, right? And people thought it was majority black just because it was 30% black, right? But people, you know, expanded the numbers when they saw a group of kids, they just made it that much bigger. And it just it was fascinating to me to, you know, go outside of Columbia and see what schools are that are really dealing with violence. Like we might have a fist fight or two every now and then, but like, that was it, you know? Um, so, so yeah, like, like getting to see people's perceptions within Columbia, and I guess that's what made me want to study so much, get the facts. Like, what is the median household income? What is the median household income in Columbia? What's Black income? What's, well, what's white? What's Latino? Um, and that's why I like the racial wealth divide, too, studying racial economic inequality. It doesn't deal so much with feelings and perceptions. It's with quantitative numbers and are things moving forward, right? It doesn't matter... If you have the first black president, that doesn't inherently bridge racial economic inequality. What bridge racial economic inequality is living, is raising the living standards of communities. And that has been the way I've been, you know, approaching uh, racial inequality is through this racial economic lens. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's um, that was a very uh, enlightening to me. 
Um, you know, and by the way, uh, I, this, my second, the second meeting ever, political meeting ever that I went to in, in Howard County was a CDC, Columbia Democratic Club meeting. And I sat, I remember sitting next to your dad <laughs> and he was he was bird dogging the people that were uh, you know uh, uh, you know speaking um, mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah that you know so uh, that this was like in 2012 or 20 you know 13 or 14 you know so uh, I just I, I thought I, I you know I share that uh, uh, Jake mentioned um, Bernie Sanders and so I I want to like I. Uh, maybe we'll close it off with this, you know, your thoughts on this, on this challenge, because I think this it is just, this, it just, and just real quick, yeah. Bernie, and, and Bernie says, mentioned the just Jackson, 88 campaign and Bernie Sanders is one of the few white politicians as mayor of Vermont. Oh, it's sorry. Of Burlington, Vermont, uh, that endorsed Jesse Jackson at that time period. So I really do see that connection. That's one critique I always had of the Bernie Sanders campaign is they should have done more with, cause they were running 20 years after the Jesse Jackson. No, no. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, 30. When did Bernie first run? So almost the year. 2018. After okay. 19. Yeah, if it was yeah. 1988, yeah, 1988, 26, 20, uh, 2016. 2016, yeah. Uh, yeah okay, almost yeah. 30, um, yeah, almost 30. Yeah, almost 30 years. 2020 was the first 30 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Sorry, go ahead, your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the critiques um, that with Bernie Sanders was that uh, his message, his economic message applied broadly to especially people with low, in, in the low socioeconomic you know, uh, you know, uh, strata. And statistically speaking, those are people of color. And it, 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 would, it would have benefited you know that you know uh, that that category in a in a very meaningful way. I mean, it would have done you know a significant improvement. Unfortunately, what was done was you know he was you know his message was caricatured as you know like the Bernie Bros you know message. So essentially, you know it was undermined by you know if if it was um, just you know uh, roughly speaking, if it was. Like a mill, it was it was the demand. You know, they described it as the demands of a millennial white dude. You know, and it was not credible because you know. It, so that's how they you know it was. A, they tried to discredit it. So you know, that's you know that, that was you know I think um, the, you know the the problem. And and how you know so generally speaking, we have two parties. The other party, we've lost them. They're not you know they're not even on this planet anymore. We have the Democratic Party, but the Democratic Party is terrible at race because it exploits it for corporate welfare, and that's a, you know that's a, that's that's the that's the challenge that we have. As in, like as the candidates who are, you know, who are, you know, as candidates here and and uh, and as people who are sharing this message, how do we how do we, um, you know, um, ensure that we're you know, we, I, I don't want to say we are more effective than Bernie Sanders because I think he was, you know, he was really, you know, effective, but unfortunately was discredited by a very connected media. But uh, how, do, how do we ensure that our message in terms of, you know, economic, economic message that benefits, you know, people, you know, poor people, you know, um, uh, specifically um, is, you know, breaks through over this superficial, you know, uh, message yeah, of the yeah. Democratic Party. Yeah, I mean, and I, I don't think there's a way to ensure it. And I, I do critique, I was supporting Bernie Sanders, both presidential campaigns. I do critique, I do believe he's kind of was caught up in and a lot of, you know, white left are caught up in that I'm going to not talk about race because I think that will appeal to more people. I think Jesse Jackson showed the opposite of that. And but what but, but I learned from both, though, is they both were running against the party from within the party. Right. And so and when you run against the establishment, the establishment is going to run against you. Right. So like, you know, they were attacking Bernie. They were tearing apart Jesse Jackson. I mean, they were acting like they're like, why is he even running? There's no way he can run. There's no way he can win. You know, he's associated with terrorists because he was 
uh, support of the Palestinian people. You know what I mean? He's crazy. He's talking about gay rights when no one was talking about gay rights. You know, he's so, um, you know, we have to understand, like, we're running in the Democratic Party to run against the establishment of the Democratic Party. I go back to the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, right, with like Fannie Lou Hamer, is that you're running against the establishment to uh, really push the party to a space that really its leadership doesn't want to go. And, you know, and, and, that, and that's why I'm excited to run, particularly with a group, you know, a, like, like, like a coalition of, of all of us who are saying, we're going to push the establishment to be better than uh, what it has been, you know, because the establishment has never been at the forefront of race. Like whenever the establishment is acting like they're at the forefront of racial equity, you know, that's a falsehood. If you just study any type of history of, you know, black freedom movement, Latino freedom movement, even Asian American, like you always have to run against the establishment. So like, that's what we're doing today. We're running against establishment as Democrats, because we feel there's more space in that party to uh, push, but it's, going to be a serious fight, just like they did everything possible to beat Bernie Sanders. And they did the second time. And what was amazing was how well he did and that he almost did win uh, the nomination. Um, but I think there is, and I think we've seen across the country, there's more possibilities of getting that type of progressive win uh, at the local level, you know, and really just the fact that Bernie Sanders was a senator <laughs> or was a mayor, all of that was amazing, right? So like, I will put us on that level if as, as we win Columbia Democratic Central Committee, it's amazing if a strong progressive coalition comes in and, uh, and, and gets into Columbia politics and uh, starts being able to make a stand and hopefully we can keep pushing that forward. Thank you, uh, Diedrich, that was very, uh enlightening uh, i uh, really appreciated this you know this uh, conversation uh looking forward to uh many successes uh you know for you know for personally for you and then as a slate uh for 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 us as well uh and for for the county uh you know having said that uh so this that's the end of our uh, uh that's the first part of our uh, uh discussion uh so thanks uh, Diedrich. Uh,